The final push for votes on the final day of the EU referendum campaign. Four months after the Prime Minister set the date for an historic poll, both sides have made one last plea to voters to make a difference. We are on the verge, I think, of making history in our country and in the whole of the European Union. And I think tomorrow we are going to, I hope very much, that we're going to vote Leave, don't you? Yes. Go out and vote Remain for a bigger, better Britain inside a reformed European Union. Stronger, safer, better off. A day to go. Let's do it. Thank you very much. I'm live in Westminster as the referendum campaign comes to a head. Also on the programme tonight, Remembering Joe, services around the world for the MP who yearned for a different style of politics. Speaking out, Sir Cliff, on the emotional trauma of those abuse allegations against him. And mud, floods and gridlock. Yes, Glastonbury gets underway. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale in Westminster and Mark Austin in the studio. Good evening from Westminster where the official referendum campaigning is coming to a close. Soon it will be time for the people to decide whether we remain in or whether we leave the EU. Polls open in a little over 12 hours in what for many of us will be the biggest single political decision we will ever make. Today, politicians from both sides have been travelling the country in a final push for votes. In just a moment, we'll hear from our political correspondent, Libby Wiener, who's with Boris Johnson and the Leave team. But first, to our deputy political editor, Chris Chip, who spent the day with the Prime Minister and Remain. Morning, Prime Minister. Morning, Chris. How are you? All right. When we filmed David Cameron stepping off the campaign bus in Bristol this morning, there were less than 24 hours left until the polls opened. No time for any new arguments in this referendum and barely time to rehearse the old ones. Chris, 50% going to Europe. Got to keep the single market open. Are you going to put a pair on that? I think, luckily, those aren't quite my size. They're going to be a little bit, they're going to be a little bit small, so I think we're all right. He declined our invitation to try on these wheeled shoes. These ones are going to France, and so too would 30 jobs here, said the boss of the UK votes to leave. Little surprise then, this staff member we spoke to is not voting for Brexit. I'm voting with Remain. Right. And just because of the company or because... Uh, because I don't, I don't think it gets any better than free trade with Europe. One vote in the bag, so on the road and through the unseasonable weather to the next stop and to a man who knows what it's like to lead a party divided over Europe. And this then is uh, stop number two, where the current Prime Minister is being joined by the former Prime Minister, John Major. And of course, if David Cameron doesn't get this right, if he doesn't win tomorrow, he too could be a former Prime Minister within a matter of days. I remember a large number of arguments about Europe. Despite that, I passionately believe our jobs, our homes, our future, our families, our lifestyle is safer inside the European Union. On to Swindon and a new housing development, a sector Mr Cameron says would be hard hit if we left the EU. But as we found of the seven bricklayers looking down on the Prime Minister, more than half want out. So you're probably out. You're definitely out. Definitely out. Definitely out. Definitely out. In. In. Out. Out. In. In. Out. out. And the main reason for voting leave? Immigration. So the one reason you're going to vote out is immigration? Yes, definitely. And nothing you've heard on this campaign can make you change your mind? <laughs> A good moment then to ask the Prime Minister why his message on the economy hasn't been getting through. I definitely think it's right that a strong economy means you build more houses. If we, what have I learned? In but these are guys who work being, in the industry, and they're voting. Well, there's, that's why I'm going around the country, still getting this message across. A strong economy is one that builds houses, that builds schools, that provides for our hospitals. You've been making this point for so long now, Prime Minister, and yet people like that that I've just spoken to, they just simply haven't listened to that advice. Well, I think the argument is very strong, and I think as people go to the polling booth, of course immigration is an important issue, but you don't tackle immigration by tanking our economy. No place of work was missed today. There was a farm with cows and a former Labour leader. There was a cafe with war veterans and a former Lib Dem leader. Never could the Prime Minister have thought his referendum would end up being such a close race to the finish line. 
And the finish line for campaigning was in Birmingham this evening. David Cameron said one word summed up the Remain campaign together. But he might just be wondering tonight if the country will vote to be a part. Chris Ship, ITV News, Birmingham. He may have been a late convert to the Leave cause, but Boris Johnson has undoubtedly been its star player. At London's Billingsgate Market, though, today, not everyone was won over. No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say anything. Oh, no. yeah. A once-in-a-lifetime choice, he argues, so holding a wet fish wasn't too much to ask, although apparently kissing it was. Then it was on to the Midlands, where out and about in Ashby de la Zouch, he found another slippery customer. Why would you leave it, lead, like, leap into the unknown? Like, it'll, be, it'll be fantastic. So the whole of England, you want to eat? It's not on his advice, you know? But as he headed north for another campaign stop, it was comments by one of his own colleagues that were causing an upset. In a radio interview, the Justice Secretary, Michael Gove, had compared pro-EU economists to those in the pay of the Nazis who had smeared Albert Einstein in the 1930s. He later apologised. I am sorry. I was asked a direct question and I answered it in a clumsy way with an inappropriate historical analogy. Throughout this campaign, I've tried very hard to avoid any sort of personal comments and I certainly didn't mean to offend anyone with that. So I regret it, I misspoke and I do apologise. No doubting the popularity of this Leave politician as he arrived in Selby, North Yorkshire. But was he worried Mr Gove's comments might detract from his message? I think it's certainly a distraction for you to mention it uh, now when actually what people want to focus on is the uh, the big choice that our country faces and it's between but he was uh, the one who brought it staying, up he was suggesting that experts had something in common with people who were in the pay of the Nazis well, that was uh, pretty um, serious suggestion that the people like Christine Lagarde I think, I think you've accurately IMF. described it Libby as a distraction and that's that's exactly how would you I find would it a bit embarrassing that a colleague of yours is talking and what I would terms? say is that uh, we've got very few hours now until uh, he was using a metaphor and, and he said what he said about it. Uh, we've got very few hours now before the public have to make up their mind about a, a, a crucial decision. He's using every last hour of this campaign to try to win over the undecided. His view that out of the union we joined back in 1973, there'll be more opportunities, not fewer. It's about taking back control of our democracy, isn't it? Yes. It's about who runs yes. this country, but it's about how we make our laws how we set our taxes, who is basically in charge of this wonderful country of ours. Weeks of frenetic campaigning end tonight. Then it'll be over to the voters to decide whether his arguments are convincing or not. Libby Vina, ITV News, Selby. Well, as politicians here make last-minute pleas to British voters, political leaders across Europe repeated calls for the UK to stay. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker warned that out is out and there would be no going back in the event of a so-called Brexit. And the French President Francois Hollande said a vote to leave would seriously risk the UK's access to the single market and warned the very future of the EU was at risk. Here, meanwhile, the post office says there's been a huge surge in people buying euros and US dollars before Thursday's vote. It's all over fears of a possible fall in the value of the pound should Britain vote to leave. Well, our business editor, Joel Hills, joins me now from central London. Joel, how much demand has the post office had? Uh, well, the post office is pointing to people hedging their bets. It's saying that uh, foreign currency transactions are up 74% this week on the same week last year and that therefore people are betting that one there's a fair chance that the leave campaign will emerge victorious and two if they do that the value of the pound will fall now both are fair assumptions and here is why we know that the value of the pound since November has bounced around uh, with a clear link to the opinion polls and that the opinion polls on the eve of the referendum show both campaigns running uh, neck and neck. The logic here is impenetrable. If Britain votes to leave the EU, there will be a transition period where our economic prospects look uncertain. In the city, they're braced for swings potentially on currency markets, stock markets, government debt markets. The next 24 hours, 48 hours, will be interesting. Joel Hills, thank you. 
Now, of almost 46 and a half million people are registered to vote tomorrow. That's a record number. Turnout is also expected to be high. But four months after the starting gun, has everybody made up their minds? Our national editor, Allegra Stratton, heard the views of voters from across the country. Around the UK, four groups of friends and family have been trying to decide how to vote. Kate, her dad and son in Nutsford, Vash and her friends in Leicester, Cara and Co in the Glasgow Beauty Parlour and Shannon and Neil at the day nursery in Essex. I was in at the beginning, then I was fervently out and the one thing that's making me sway is the economy. I'm having a little bit of a wobble about the economy. Britain is a country can survive on its own, it can do well on its own, which it already has. I just don't think if we leave we'll be any worse off, but then it's just the uncertainty. Throughout the whole campaign, I've been confused, wondering whether I'm prepared to take the risk myself in terms of voting to leave. The name that crops up the most is Boris Johnson. My main influence at first was Boris. I thought he'd come up with some really good points. He is a very passionate character. Normally I wouldn't watch debates, but watching him do something, it, it makes it a bit more entertaining. Boris has been positive. I felt a lot of the things, I mean, if you watch him when they're throwing all this personal stuff at him. He hasn't dropped to that level. He's, he's, you know, he's been cool through the whole campaign. But what about the nature of the campaign? I find it hard to express how saddened I feel about the whole thing. There's, there's been too much negativity, too much bashing of each other in this, and it's, it's not something I really would ever want to get involved in again. Others have loved being asked to make a choice. You can walk down the street and talk with absolutely anybody, whether you know them or not, What's your view on the EU? It's something that actually has brought the country together in many ways, I think. No, I, I agree with you on that one, Dave. Unfortunately, on the June 23rd, we'll be voting with our emotions rather than with facts. Mm. And that is going to be the biggest problem. Everybody realises that this is the decision of probably a generation. It will affect the country as a whole. This is a massive, massive decision that everyone has got to take part of. The conversations are now nearly over. Tomorrow, they must make their choice. Allegra Stratton, ITV News. Our political editor Robert Peston joins me now. OK, just over 12 hours to go until the polls open. How do you assess where we are at this stage? Well, we've had the most passionate campaign. We've had spin. We've had downright lies. We've had emotions. You can probably hear Vera Lynn in the background uh, <laughs> until we're in the closing straits of all of this. And what have we seen? Well, we've seen a divided Tory party. Uh, we've seen a Labour Party split from many of its working class voters. We've seen the leave leaning English regions pitted against the Remain siding Scotland and London. Now, what will that mean for the overall vote? If you look at the opinion polls, actually right now they're showing a small lead for leave, but broadly too close to call. Strikingly, if you look at the price of the pound or betting odds, they are saying with a high degree of confidence that Remain will win. And it's important to know that investors have commissioned private polls, which we haven't seen. However, none of this matters. What matters is what we do tomorrow. What would many people say would be the worst outcome. It would be a very close result which kept this debate going and kept the spectacle of a divided Britain for a world that I think has not been wholly impressed by the way we've been fighting each other. OK, Robert, thank you. Well, if you are one of the many still undecided, there is a lot more information on our website. Go to itv.com slash remain or leave and we will have all the drama right here on ITV1, ITV from 10pm tomorrow night. Do join Tom Bradby for Referendum Result Live. And that is all from me. Now to Mark for the rest of the day's news. Mark. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. The life and legacy of MP Jo Cox has been celebrated in services across the world on what would have been her 42nd birthday. In the main event in Trafalgar Square, her husband Brendan said it was ironic that the hate that killed her had provoked such an outpouring of love. He said that above all else, Jo was a great mum and today was an opportunity for their children to see what she meant to so many people. Paul Davis reports. Jo Cox's husband Brendan her children, Coolin and Layla, made the short journey down the Thames from their houseboat home to witness an outpouring of affection and respect for the wife, the mother, they lost last week. 
a packed Trafalgar Square honouring what would have been the MP's 42nd birthday. Thank you for coming together today to honour the memory of Joe, not just here in London, in Batley, but around the world. Thank you also for the love that you've all poured on our family since our world collapsed on Thursday. What a contrast, he said, with what happened in Bristol. It was an act of terror designed to advance an agenda of hatred towards others. What a beautiful irony it is that an act designed to advance hatred has instead generated such an outpouring of love. There was a minute's silence to remember Joe Cox. Observed simultaneously around the world, here in Washington, D.C., and closer to home in Joe Cox's West Yorkshire constituency, where her sister spoke. My sister would want her murder to mobilise people, to get on with things, to try to make a positive difference in whatever way we can, to come together and unite against hate and division. Back in Trafalgar Square, there were musical tributes, a favourite campaigning song from the choir of Coolin Cox's school. Joe Cox had all the patience in the world for people who needed help. And a message from Bono, who'd campaigned against poverty with the MP. Malala Yousafzai acknowledged the MP's work for educating girls worldwide. But she showed us all that you can be small and still be a giant. And that was Joe was, a giant. An emotional gathering, part memorial, part celebration of all Joe Cox achieved in her almost 42 years, ended with a chorus of one of her favorite songs. Paul Davis, ITV News. Tribute to Joe Cox. Sir Cliff Richard has spoken of the emotional trauma he was put through after being falsely accused of sexual abuse. Giving his first broadcast interview since he was cleared of all charges, he told ITV his name had been publicly smeared. As Sejal Carrier reports, uh, the singer wants a change in the law to protect innocent people. For nearly two years, Sir Cliff Richard's been living under a cloud of suspicion. His name smeared and his integrity questioned. Today, he broke his silence. And here I am, 22 months and a week later, and um, no charge. I don't like the idea of being collateral damage. And that's what I've been for two, two, 22 months. Though innocent, he says he doesn't feel completely exonerated because prosecutors told him there was insufficient evidence to prosecute. In a way, I still feel tarnished because insufficient suggests that maybe there's something there, and I know there wasn't. In 2014, a raid on Sir Cliff's penthouse apartment was filmed by the BBC following a police tip-off, later shown on other channels. This was even before the singer was told he was under investigation. He said he was now considering legal action. There must have been illegal collusion. I've never known. I, I, don't, I don't think investigations take place with lighting and cameras. I feel I have every right to sue because of nothing else, definitely for the gross invasion of my privacy. The BBC's apologised to him for the distress, but stands by its decision to report the investigation. South Yorkshire Police has also apologised for its handling of the media interest. Sir Cliff believes suspects' identities should be protected under law. In, in the case of people like myself or anybody, the name should never be out there unless you have been charged. For now, he wants to begin recovering from the ordeal he's endured. Sejal Karia, ITV News. A Scottish woman convicted of drug smuggling in Peru has been released from prison and is on her way back to the UK. Melissa Reid spent almost three years in jail after being caught trying to smuggle one and a half million pounds worth of cocaine. And finally, it's summer, it's Glastonbury, and once again, the headline act is the weather. 
Torrential rain has turned the Somerset site into a quagmire, making access extremely tricky and causing massive traffic jams. Some festival goers had to queue for 12 hours to get in. Somehow, our reporter Rupert Evelyn has managed to get there, and this is what he found. Roughing it is part of the festival experience, but today it began off-site. Hours spent queuing in the Somerset countryside. And as if to really rub it in, when they eventually got to Glastonbury, the mud did little to speed up progress. Why does it always look like this? And yet somehow you sense people here wouldn't have Glastonbury any other way. It'll be all right in the end. And we got here about an hour ago, but it took us six hours. Six hours? Six from, hours. Where, where were you coming from? Just from Bristol. Yeah. What? Yeah, we had a bit of trouble with the motorways being closed, which I don't even know why, you know, they were closing when they knew 100,000 people were going to be coming down here. Although at times it looked like it, it would be unfair to say the wheels have come off this British institution before the show has even started. Despite the loss of traction for many, and the impending threat from ominous skies, it takes a lot more than mud to dampen spirits here. <laughs> and you're worried about you, the weather forecast? Is it gonna no, be it's going to be good, it's going to be optimistic. good, We're optimistic, right. yeah. The pain of getting here is soon forgotten. Home for the next five nights is a tented city. It may not always be comfortable, and it certainly isn't for everyone, but this place for tens of thousands of people is the only place to be right now, whatever the conditions. Well, while off-site the system toyed with failing, on-site it has for the most part worked. And here are the famous last words. The forecast is good. It's possible that the headline act may be the music rather than the mud. All right, Rupert, thank you and enjoy. That's it for now. Raggy Omar will be here at around 10.15, but from Mary in Westminster and from all the team here, have a very good evening. Bye-bye.